Hi, everyone, and welcome to Tracks Through Time. I am your host and FreightWaves Deputy Editor, Brie L. Jekyll, and I'm here to tell you about some of the most interesting stories throughout history in transportation and freight. And I'm here again with Mary O'Connell, our fellow FreightWaves TV host and 3PL expert. And today we are turning our, text, our attention to a tragic chapter in American history um, that a lot of people kind of have forgotten about. And that is the Texas City disaster. So, oh, I was going to say, um, what Texas City? Because there's been a lot of disasters happening in Texas. Uh, so I feel like I'm excited. I don't know what this is about. So I'm very excited to get into it. Not because it, there's a disaster, but because I'm going to learn about it. The city in Texas is Texas City. There's a city in Texas <laughs> called Texas City. That's embarrassing. Okay, Gary. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. <laughs> All right. So, well, I thought now, it was just a city in Texas. Oh, I know what you thought. <laughs> it made me very happy. <laughs> All right. Now, on a more somber note, because um, this is very, very sad. Uh, on April 16th, 1947, disaster struck the bustling port city of Texas City, Texas, leaving destruction, death, and scars that would really last for generations. Uh, and in this episode, we're going to explore the events leading up to the disaster and the devastating explosion itself, its immediate aftermath, and the lasting impact it had on safety regulations in the United States. So first, let's set the stage. In the late 1940s, Texas City was really a thriving hub of industry. So it was bustling with activity at its docks, refineries and warehouses. Uh, it was really a critical link in the transportation of goods. And its importance in the cargo trade was, was growing by the day at this time. So it was really an important part in the logistics industry. So the city's port filled with cargo ships. It, it was central to this economic boom. So oil, chemicals, and other goods, they flowed in and out of Texas City a lot. And they they drove the local economy and really provided employment to thousands of workers. So again, very important. And on that fateful morning of April 16th, a French vessel known as the SSS, the SS Grand Camp, was docked at the city, tex the Texas City port and it was loaded with a highly volatile cargo. And that was ammonium nitrate, which is a chemical commonly used in fertilizers and explosives. So unknown to many at the time, the ammonium nitrate was prone to combustion when exposed to heat or fire. And that's exactly what happened when tragedy struck uh, the SS Grand Camp. And it's crazy to think about how important knowledge is because years later, we are very aware how unstable this property is. But back then, they had no clue. So n no real precautions were taken. And once the fire struck, a lot of um, bad decision making occurred just because of the lack of knowledge. I, I think so, uh, I, I'm very curious to know if this incident, like I had to have like born some new and maybe we'll get into it, born like some new regulations on like you know, how to ship things or things that how they are stored at ports. I'm curious if that is like the reason for any like regulations we see today. It is the reason for regulations you see today. So while we don't really know, like the public doesn't really have like this is isn't in a lot of movies, things like that, you know, um, it's, it's so it's much lesser known, but it is for sure the reason why we have um, some of the regulations we have today. It was it was really important. So while this is an absolute tragedy. Um, a lot of it saved a lot of lives later on. So at eight o'clock in the morning, crew members saw smoke where the ammonium nitrate fertilizer was was stored, and then they made a fatal flaw when they decided to try to snuff out the fire instead of using water to ex extinguish it, trying to save the cargo. So again, another uh, decision made. Um, 
pushed by thoughts of money, um, was the, responsible for quite a lot of deaths. And yet another reason that is very crucial, more than ever, that you need to educate drivers on if it comes down to you or cargo, always save yourself. The cargo can be replaced. You cannot. Exactly. I think that's another important thing that kind of grew out of this is that is safety was kind of thought about more so of just, you know, making sure the cargo is <laughs> is safe. Um, but yeah, of course, their attempt failed and temperatures inside the cargo hold rose to dangerously high levels. And so at this time, the, the local firefighters joined on. They were completely unaware of how hazardous this cargo was. So they rushed to the scene to combat the flames and bystanders were gathered around to watch the commotion. I mean, there was tons of people at the any time any kind of fire or excitement broke out. Um, especially in the 40s, people would gather around. Uh, I know I, I, podcasts joke about how why true crime now? Um, it, uh, there's always interested in true <laughs> crime and disaster watching. It's always been a thing. Um, but yeah, so at 9 a.m., an unimaginable explosion tore through the Grand Camp and it sent a shockwave through uh, that completely devastated the city. I mean, this explosion is it, is almost unbelievable. It was so powerful that it shattered windows in Houston, which is nearly 40 miles away. In Texas City, entire neighborhoods were just obliterated. They were just gone in a moment. Um, the death toll was was really starting to climb. And on top of that, a tidal wave that reached 15 feet high crashed through the dock and the nearby area. That Hospitals is like, were over. That is like absolutely insane. You're just sitting in your house, like enjoying a normal, like... <laughs> day and then boom you're not oh uh, absolutely i have um i have a quote that kind of really puts it into perspective like i can't like just imagine us sitting here in our homes now and then all of a sudden it's just the town is decimated um that's exactly what happened to them the hospitals were overwhelmed uh in this is horrible but injured and, and dying people were literally filling the streets with nowhere to go uh it left an absolute crazy mark on the survivors and the city itself for for years afterwards um 28 texas city firefighters including the chief were killed in that first uh first explosion that first blast uh and then the intensity of the blast had shrapnel in all directions nearby and and it was all on fire so flaming debris were igniting giant tanks full of oil and chemicals um, that were stored at at nearby refineries which set off smaller explosions afterwards through around there was a barge that was anchored in the port that traveled a hundred feet away on the shore, and it because it because it was just pushed by the explosion. Emergency relief efforts worked well into the night and the following days to combat the fire that continually burned in the surrounding areas. Once it gets hold, like it, it's almost impossible to take it's, out. Absolutely, and c there's all these little things that are fueling it, and it's still you know ongoing. Um, seismographs in Denver were uh, picked up the blast in Denver from Texas. Uh, one man, a dock worker named Pete Suderman, he reported that he had been thrown 30 feet in the air across the dock along with his coworkers. So they just kind of all were thrown. Um, the Texas City Moore Memorial Public Library, they quoted a woman uh, who lived in the area at the time. Uh, her name was Natty Morrow. She said that suddenly a thundering boom sounded and seconds later, the door ripped off its facing, skidded across the kitchen floor and slammed down to the table where she sat with the baby. The house toppled to one side and sat off its piers at a crazy angle and broken glass was filled the air. We didn't know what was happening. That's another thing. It's like you don't you have no idea what's happening if it's a, an attack, an explosion of uh, like you're just all of a sudden, all this destruction is around you and you have no clue where it came from or what's happening. Right. And then you're like, is it safer to go outside or stay inside? If my house is at a pier or if my house is, you know, off of its foundation, it could fall any minute. But is it safer to stay in it and risk potentially falling with it or go outside where you could, you know, get knocked back from explosions? Right. Yeah, I remember I was in an earthquake in New Jersey, which is super rare. And all of us were just left wondering, like, was that an explosion? Was it a terrorist attack? Like, we literally went to like a bomb because it was we had never experienced anything like that. We were so confused. And so nobody knew what to do. We were kind of all just going. Uh. My one friend ran down the street like down the mile was crazy. Um, But so 
at the time, this is also another crazy coincidence. At the time, there was a a phone operator strike. So there was nobody operating the phones at the um, emergency uh, buildings. And so, but when the picketers learned of the disaster, they quickly went back to work um, to help as much as they could. But it, it really did delay things. So um, it, it did kind of cause a little bit of problems, but it was just, you know, everyone band together to kind of just save as many lives as they could and, and you know, help out as much as they could. Um, after that, all, rescue workers from all over the surrounding areas started to respond like immediately. The U.S. Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Reserves and the National Guard, they all sent teams made up of doctors, nurses, ambulances. Uh, the University of Texas, the medical branch at Galveston, sent doctors, nurses, and medical students to help. And then also firefighters from Galveston, Houston, um, uh, all the surrounding towns, they kind of all came just to to do what they could. I mean, in that situation, it's all hands on deck. Like even med students, like they at least know how to pack a wound and get you to stop bleeding or do a, like an assessment. I don't even know where you would begin in a disaster like that of like assessing people. Like obviously you have like you know, those trauma cards that are like, this person needs to go now, this person, um, you know, just maybe has some bumps and bruises and can sit and wait. Um, I don't even know where you would begin to start with all that because like there's, there's, it's all over town. It's not just in one central location. And it, it's worse. There was no, no current hospital. In, yeah, there was no hospital in the city at the time. Of course So not. volunteers, volunteers had to just make makeshift infirmaries they took over city hall and the chamber of commerce buildings and they just kind of set up infirmaries there um and then they evacuated as many people as they could that were hurt uh to hospitals in like houston and, and nearby areas but still you know 40 miles is a yeah is a crucial time you know yeah so it, it, it was uh a disaster area for sure i mean one of the worst that we've ever seen in the United States. Um, and then, so of course, in the wake of the disaster, a lot of questions started to come about, about safety, about the safety of transporting and storing hazardous materials. Um, they launched a lot of investigations and it became clear that regu regulatory changes were definitely needed to prevent a cata uh, catastrophe like this from happening again. The Texas City disaster played a pivotal role in shaping safety regulations and emergency response protocols in the U.S. It served as a stark reminder of the importance of proper handling and storage. Um, and, you know, as I as I finish this story today, um, it's really important to remember the lives lost and the lives that were forever changed by this tragic event. Um, the disaster is often overlooked in the broader scope of American history, but really its its impact on safety standards and emergency preparedness is, is a huge important part of regulations today. Um, but thank you for enjoy uh, thank you for joining us on this somber but important exploration of the Texas City disaster. We will talk some facts now, but I just want to say that it is um uh we hope that by remembering this tragedy, we can really honor the memory of those affected and ensure that we can really learn some lessons here and continue to shape a safer future. Um, so it's funny, actually, it's not funny, um, but the uh, the regulations and everything, um, you know, I having come into the world and the supply chain world well after 1940s, I was always very impressed with, um, you know, the safety data sheets, all the requirements that come with handling hazardous material. And I had no idea about this uh, in this in incident. Um, I mean, we saw it, what, 15 minutes ago when I was like, what city in Texas? And you were like, no, literally, it's called right. Texas City. Um, <laughs> I did not even know where it was until you brought it up. But still, it's one of those where like as someone who's had to learn the hazardous materials, who's shipped hazardous materials, um, and not only I grew up so my dad's in um, purchasing and procurement. So he always had the little book in his car of like, uh, you know, how when you drive down the road, you see trucks with like placards on them and certain ones mean different things. Well, on long car rides, I would take that book and like read through and see like, OK, this is what the red uh, this is what like the white fire on the red background and this number means, because that tells you in that uh, load, you know, it tells you this is what happens if it spills. This is like the, the radius you need to clear. This is like how you try to put it out because sometimes those those 
things fall over and also like you just it, it looks like nothing's happening but there could be like toxic gas or like you know mm-hmm. something like that which would could make people pass out and potentially anyone that comes in without knowing um try to save them it's not going to work out um but i feel like we can't talk about safety and regulations for has transporting hazardous materials without bringing out the cfr 49 um this just don't worry it's not the whole thing it's just parts 105 through 180 uh but thankfully it does have it does have ammonia nitrate so after this uh incident this is now the it, across this hazardous material table this is now the things that you can do with um ammonia nitrate based fertilizers it's a hazard class nine um its identification number is 2067 you're into that um and it's got some other codes which we're not going to go into it's it's boring um but the most important thing is that only 200 kilograms can go on passenger aircraft or passenger rail uh, or not passenger rail or on rail and only 200 air milligram kilograms can go on cargo craft um for transportation unless it's ammonia nitrate emulsion and then it's forbidden on everything oh so um there are no exceptions at all and ammonia nitrate as a fertilizer has one exception but again we don't have to, we don't we don't want to sit here and read the most boring book known to man but um there are no, no but i do like it place. the visual asp- aspect that shows how important regulation is today and how thorough we are today compare i mean i don't even I mean, think there was a book it's a it's like what a a one and a half knuckle uh tight um but don't worry it's not the full thing just part of it uh but also this is as of 2018 because i i don't get the new one that comes out all the time so but yeah if everyone ever, if anyone ever wonders what secretly hides in that in that cubby right there it's this you just gotta be safe um but yeah so i you know i don't love that a natural or not a natural a horrible disaster caused us to take these things seriously um but as someone who has worked in jobs where i've had to go why do i have to fill out these safety data sheets it doesn't like everybody knows what they're doing no they don't they really don't mm-hmm. and safety data sheets are important and we should take them seriously I mean, we've gone this whole episode without even mentioning East Palestine. Um, I mean, this, so this kind of stuff still obviously happens today, but with that kind of stuff in place, like it's really helped save a lot of lives. Um, you know, obviously there's more room to grow and, you know, more stricter like standards, um, you know, in following this stuff. But, um, yeah, yeah, this stuff is, is really, really important. So, um, new standards um for uh, ammonium nitrate specifically came into play after this um in addition to cool temperatures um they had to have specialized containers for storage and like you said prohibit the amount um of, from being stored near uh, reactive materials um yeah they started to say that travel over long distances were uh discouraged and overseas it's even gotten to the point where like certain like if it's stored in a bag or a container or however it's being stored on that thing like there's certain rules and regulations on where it can be stored on side that ship or that car- that cargo right um like it can't be by steam pipes electric circuits and if it is on there um, and like in a ship or whatever, it has to go through. There has to be a fire watch on that specific thing. So that way, if it does go up, they can get to it as fast as they can. Mm-hmm. They also um, really did um, created new regulations in disaster planning. So in the response to it as well. So um, they, you know, it's, it was more proactive rather than, you know, trying to snuff out a fire with hazardous materials hoping to save the cargo. <laughs> um, um, so a lot of people decided that a centrally coordinated emergency response effort was probably the smartest thing that, that they could have done then, um, like a, a, as soon as the disaster kind of took off. So as a result, refineries in the area, st- they formed the Industrial Mutual Aid System, IMAS, uh, which was a cooperative endeavor in which they agreed to help each other out in the event of a disaster. So all these refineries in industrial zones across Texas followed suit. So they kind of banded together to say like, hey, we're going to save each other in, in case of a disaster. Well, I mean, a lot of these refineries aren't exactly typically in like 
you know, your major metropolitan areas. You're not going to mm-hmm. find a refinery in the heart of downtown Dallas. And so um, they might still be like, you know, an hour outside of downtown, but it's, you're going to be these smaller communities where to get the reinforcements they need is going to be, uh, there's going to be time, which people just don't have. So right. I do love that they were like, well, we're, we're all we have out here. So we got to help each other until, you know, we can get some reinforcements in, which anyone who's, you know, dealt with that, it can take, it can take some time because you have to, you know, rally a bunch of people. Um, and it could be an hour or two until you get true, like extra bodies able to help. So it's just kind of that good old, really got to rely on your neighbor type thing. Yeah. The um they so they then they investigated the explosion and the fire, but they couldn't find the original cause of the fire. But they did conclude that conditions on the ship were definitely going to cause a reaction uh, of the mo- ammonium nitrate. So it's it's like crazy to think like if only they knew. Yeah. If only. Yeah. Um, it truly so- is wild how far we've come in certain areas. Um, because I mean I. I mm-hmm. would be shocked if I heard of something like this happening today. I mean, I was. I when know. We had a train derailment in Ohio. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't anything like this, but, you know, it's still crazy. I mean, all. Yeah. Um, of course, literally hundreds of lawsuits were filed on behalf of the disaster victims. Um, one of the most notable cases was... Um, uh, the Dalahite case of 1950, um, it was a bunch of people who was several complaints compiled um, into one lawsuit and they filed jointly against the federal government and the case made it to the Supreme Court where they ruled in favor of the U.S. government. Um, at the time of the disaster, FEMA didn't exist. Um, so there was uh, there wasn't any kind of government uh, agency to kind of provide um, disaster aid. Um, to everyone who lost their home. So um, they kind of introduced uh, legislation to Congress that would provide compensation to the disaster disaster victims to help them build their their homes. Um, And it passed in 1955, and it it allowed $17 million to be distributed amongst uh, 1,400 claimants. So that's, that's really, really cool. Absolutely insane. I actually just looked it up because I was curious. FEMA actually didn't uh, start until 1979. So almost 40 years later. And that's your fun fact of the day. <laughs> April 1st. It's a, It's not an April Fool's joke, but April 1st of 1979 is of when FEMA was officially created. Uh, it was an executive order from President Jimmy Carter. Oh, Jimmy but Carter has done But you can say that. that some of their history can be traced as far back as 1803. So I'm guessing they probably did something with the Army Corps of Engineers in like a partnership yeah. um, up until the 80s. You're probably right. So, um, I'll take it. Oh, kind of. So cool. the uh, Monsanto uh, factory or facility nearby that had the worst damage. That that was like completely flattened. Um, and it was the first refinery to pledge to rebuild so that the comp- so that the town wouldn't lose its, you know, economic standing. Um, so other other companies quickly followed that uh, company's uh, pledge and they they rebuilt the town gradually and they they banded together and they they rebuilt their town. And according at the time of the 2010 census, it was home to about 45,000 people and the city is still growing today. That's impressive. I did look it up. Um, and I, uh, I like while we were chit chatting today, I did look it up and I have context for it now. It's like right. That's like the first city on land from Galveston. Because I guess oh. Galveston's like an island. So, um, yeah, that's kind of cool. OK, yeah, I'm not a huge Texas geography la- lady. <laughs> I was not either, but I am now. I now Seriously. know where <laughs> Texas City is. All right. Well, that marks to the end of today's episode and thank you everyone for tuning in and a big thanks to the um, government of Texas for giving us all our information today. Um, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jaco Brielle to see what else we have going on at Freight Waves Classics. And you can email me at bjaco at freightwaves.com and tune in to every two weeks for our next episode on Freight Waves TV or listen to the show wherever you get your podcasts.